Have your Bibles, if you would. <clears throat> Take your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 24. Isaiah, chapter 24. <clears throat> Isaiah 24, we're going to get right on into it, so let's all stand. If you're physically able, Isaiah chapter 24, we're going to begin reading the first, verse number 1. Isaiah 24, verse number 1. The Bible says this, <clears throat> Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with, the, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied, and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate there, therefore. The, let me read verse 6 again. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwelleth therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry-hearted do sigh. The mirth of tabrets ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoiceth endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. <clears throat> Verse 9. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. In the city is left desolation. And the gate is smitten with destruction. All right, let's have a word of prayer again. And then you can be seated. Father, we thank you, dear God, for this uh, evening that you've given us. And uh, Lord, now is the time, dear, dear God, where we are able to open up the word and Father to hear what you have to say. And Lord, I do desire to convey whatever it is, Lord, that you have to say. So Lord, I pray that you would be with my mouth, be with my thoughts. And Lord, help me, dear God, to feed your people. And Lord, I, I love you. And Lord, I'm thankful for you. I pray that we would glean from the word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> in the past several chapters of, in the book of Isaiah, we have we talked about the Lord's judgment on different nations of the earth. And uh, uh, you know, last week, uh, Brother Young filled the pulpit for me, and I'm very, very thankful for that, very appreciative of that. But in Isaiah chapter 24, it's, it's different from all the other chapters previously because the other chapters dealt with God's judgment on other nations that surrounded Judah, that surrounded Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 24, it speaks of God's judgment on a much larger, grander scale. This judgment involves the world. And Isaiah 24 involves the, whole, the judgment of the whole earth. Now, if... Uh, as we've read the Bible, we're students of the Bible, we, we've gone to church for a lengthy enough period of time, I'm looking at all of us in here, there's only a handful, not, not even a handful of times, a very limited amount of times where the Bible talks about the Lord's judgment upon the entirety of the earth. Now, the, the, the first time of the Lord's judgment upon the earth was the days of Noah, right? Noah and the ark, when God flooded the earth. And then, of course, we know that God, he's going to judge the earth again when he's going to consume it in flame. He's going to burn it up, and he's going to make a new one. And that's going to be exciting for us, for sure. But another time when God is going to judge the earth is during the Great Tribulation. And that is going to involve the whole earth. It's just not going to involve a certain type of people. It's just not going to affect the Gentiles. It's not just going to affect the Jews. No, it's going to affect everybody who was present during the tribulation time. 
in Isaiah 24 has some parallels with Revelation chapter number 20. Now, tonight, we're not going to cover the whole chapter because we just don't have that kind of time. Uh, but, and we are also not going to talk about the specific events that transpire during the tribulation period because Isaiah 24 doesn't talk about some specific events. But what we are going to talk about is what the Holy Spirit of God inspired Isaiah to write in the first 12 verses. And I think that if we can figure that out, then I think it's going to be profitable for us. All right, so, so let's get right on into it. I, what Isaiah does is that he calls to give all to give attention of what the Lord is going to do. Now, look at verse 1 here. It says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we all already know this. During the Great Tribulation, a lot of people are going to die. And when I mean a lot, I mean a lot. I, 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 listen, during the Great Tribulation, more people are going to die more than any war has ever caused people to die. I, I, I mean, just uh, Revelation chapter 9 speaks about how one third of the world's population is going to die. A third of the world. That, that, that's, that number is astronomical. It, it, it is mind-boggling. L- listen, the world as the people, uh, the world that, that brr, I can't speak tonight. The people as the world know it during the day of the tribulation. L- listen, the Bible says that the world's going to be considered like upside down. People are not going to know what to expect. People are going to be so scattered. They're going to be scattered uh, trying to seek refuge. They're going to be scattered in their thinking. The Lord is going to turn this earth into a waste, according to verse number one here. The, The world is going to be a place that no one has ever seen it to be before. Now, this judgment is going to also reveal that God is not a respecter of persons. Any person who is going to be here during the tribulation will experience the tribulation. Uh, uh, Verse number two. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As, uh, As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. Listen, the main idea is this. It doesn't matter what rank you are in society. It doesn't matter if you're the richest person on the earth. It doesn't matter if you're the poorest beggar on the street. No, no, no. If you are here during the tribulation, you will feel it. It will affect you. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live. Everyone who is going, going to go through it will go through it. Now, verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. Okay, church. The great tribulation, that was already settled in Isaiah's day. God just didn't make up one day to say, you know, I I think I'm going to do this now. No, no. This was already settled in the mind of God in eternity past, long before creation was ever th- created. I, I, I mean, this will happen. The, the, the world can try and speculate and say, no, the, the, the Lord's coming back and calling the church home. No, no, that's not going to happen. No, no, that's all wives' tale. No, that's all make-believe. That's all fake. That's all fairy tale stuff. No, no, no. This is going to happen. Well, well why? Because for the Lord has spoken this word. This is going to happen Because God said so. That's it. That should be enough. Verse number four continues on with the notion of the travesty that the world will go through. Look at verse four. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The the, the haughty people of the earth do languish. Now, we know what the word mourneth means. It means to weep. It means to cry. It says, the earth mourneth and fadeth away. Now, what does fadeth away mean? The, the, the word fadeth away, it, it gives this picture of like a, a petal from a flower that will fall. And it, it, it's, it, it 
retains its beauty for a time, but you give it time, and then it just withers. It, 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 remains, it remains pretty for a moment, but you give it enough time, it begins to wither, it begins to harden, it begins to crumble, it begins to fall apart. And, and during the Great Tribulation, uh, l- listen, w- what the world is going to go through, there's going to be a lot of mourning, there's going to be a lot of crying, but the beauty of this earth will fade away. The beauty of this planet, listen, there's a lot of beautiful places on this planet. I mean, we're, we're fortunate enough to live in Colorado, not the pretty part, <laughs> but we get to claim the pretty part. That's about all that's got going on for Colorado. <laughs> no, no, no. But we, we look at the beauty of the Rocky Mountains. Or, or, or maybe if you've ever been blessed to ever go see the, 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 the West Coast or the East Coast or the oceans or, or the Gulf, and you get to see the vastness of God's creation and the beauty thereof. Or, or, or Miss Morgan and I, we lived in New Mexico, and we got able to see some the most beautiful sunsets, and we're able to go to the, the Grand Canyon to just see the vastness and the beauty of the Grand Canyon. Hey, listen, when the tribulation period comes, listen, all of that is going to wither away. All of that beauty is going to wither away and crumble. This world is going to be empty. The word languish means to become weak feeble or to droop verse 4 says the earth mourneth and fadeth away the world languisheth and fadeth away the haughty people of the earth do languish the the haughty people now we might think of those who are prideful haughty now yes that that's kind of what it means there but the the haughty people of the earth it's referring to those who are elevated in in status of the earth Uh, those who are in position of power those are in position of rank uh, it, it means that the leaders of this world will become weak. It doesn't matter how great of a leader they are. During the Great Tribulation, they are not in control of it. They're weak. And this is what the world is going to go through during the Tribulation time. Now, here's the thing. If we know our Bibles... And if you are a saved, born-again child of God, you will not spend one second in the tribulation. Not one. You will not spend one solitary second in the tribulation period. We also need to remind ourselves of this. Every judgment that God brings, every judgment that God executes is righteous judgment. What, what, what do you mean righteous judgment? It mean, I mean this, that when he executes it, he's right in doing it. He's right in doing it. It's just that it gets done. That, that, that's what I mean by righteous judgment. And although God is exercising this judgment, also understand this. He is not responsible for the judgment. He's not responsible for it. Well, who is? Well, look at verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Well, after a judgment like this, one might ask the, the question, does God hate the earth so much he's willing to judge it to such extremes? Does God hate the earth so much? Is this God's fault? No. This judgment isn't God's fault. This judgment is man's fault. It's man's fault. It's through man's sin and wickedness that brought defilement into the world. And since there is defilement on the earth, then the only thing that God is left to do is to execute some righteous judgment on the earth. Now, verses 7 through 12, Isaiah, he further describes the scene of the judgment. Uh, Look at verse 7 through 9, actually. He says, the new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth. All the merry hearted do sigh. The mirth of tabret ceaseth. The noise of them that rejoiceth endeth. The joy of the harp ceaseth. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. Now skip down to verse 11. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. Hey, 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 listen to this, church family. 
when the great tribulations happens, there will be no more partying that the world is used to. No more partying. No more celebrations. Listen, the pubs and the bars, they'll, they'll cease to have laughter in them. Uh, uh, listen, Isaiah, he gives a description of people crying in the streets for their booze. That's what he talks about in verse 11. Hey, hey, uh, I mean, th this past New Year's Eve was like the first New Year's Eve. I didn't stay up. I mean, I was sick, so I went to bed. But, that, but, but let me tell you, I, I'm pretty sure I know what happened. The ball dropped in New York City. And there was thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the streets. And confetti fell. And I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of people with wine glasses. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people with champagne bottles. I'm pretty sure that the bars were filled and the nightclubs were filled. And everybody's uh, having their party hats on. Everyone's singing Happy New Year. And everyone's getting buzzed and having a good time. But here's the thing. When the tribulation happens, none of that's taking place. No more of that. No more nightlife. Listen, the joy in the land will be replaced by sorrow. Yeah. That's what sin does. Listen, sin does not increase pleasure. Sin diminishes it. Satan has people fooled that sin brings long-lasting pleasure. No, sin is pleasurable for a season. But, God, but, but what we see here, God's word tells us that because of sin, there will be no pleasure in the day of the great tribulation. There won't be any. Verse number 10 says, the city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. The city of confusion, that's most likely a reference there to Jerusalem. When it talks about every house being shut up, it describes that the, listen, people are going to be so afraid to leave their homes. Terrified. Verse 12, and the city is left desolation. The gate is smitten with destruction. Listen, the idea is that J Jerusalem is going to be left in ruin and that they'll be left in a vulnerable state. Listen, what God is doing through the great tribulation is he's judging the sinful wickedness of man that has defiled the earth. That, that, that's what he's doing. Here's, here's the thing. Man's sin went unchecked. And it defiled everything. That's what man's sin did. And the reason why man's sin went unchecked was because, now listen to this. Man had no regard for God's word. Yeah. Look at verse 5 again. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Listen, when Isaiah said that they have transgressed the laws, you know what the, the Hebrew wa word for laws is this, Torah. The Torah. Can I put it this way? The word of God. The word of God. They transgressed the Torah. They transgressed the word of God. Now, the, the word transgressed, it, it, it means this, to step over the line. That, that, that's literally like what it means, to, to step over the line, to, to cross over some boundaries. Listen, what God does is that God gave man boundaries through the word. That, that, that's what he's given us there. And what man has done is man has said this, I don't like God's boundaries. I like my own boundaries. I don't want to be limited to God's boundaries. I want to live according to my own boundaries. And, and what people often do is, is that people feel like, like, well, look at God's word. There's so many restrictions. There's so many things that I cannot do. And, and the world says this. No, 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 no. Go out and venture out on your own. Do what makes you happy. Do what feels good for you. Listen, rules were made to be broken. Right? That, that, that's the saying that goes on today, isn't it? But, but listen, God has set boundaries, church. God has set boundaries for man. Listen, God has set boundaries for holiness. 
God, God has set boundaries for holiness, that, and, and unfortunately, there's not even a lot of Christians that take that seriously. God has set boundaries on marriage, and we see how that's playing out in 2023. You know, sometimes I think that we as Christians, we look at God's word and think, this book, look here, let me have your attention. This book confines me. This book, this book says, I can't, I can't step over here. This book says, I can't do what I want over here. This book is making me stay right in the middle. I feel trapped by this book. I feel like I, I'm confined to this through these boundaries here. Listen, these boundaries of God's word, they're not here to confine you. The boundaries of God's word are here to protect you. Oh, I've never heard of anything like boundaries there to protect me. Are you thankful for guardrails? You know why guardrails are there? To limit you. Yeah. To make sure you have no fun going off-road. <laughs> Listen, if we went off-road, we'd be dead. Hey, guardrails are there for your protection. Listen, this book here is here for your protection. God's word, is, there's boundaries there. But yet so many people say, no, no, no. These boundaries, I feel so limited by these boundaries. No, no. I want to go venture out and I want to express who I am. I want to have my own fun. I want to live my own life. Yeah, I know what the book says and I know what the preacher says and I know what that church believes. But here's the thing. This life is a boring life. This life is a safe life. This is the most protected life you can ever live. Listen, they had no regard for God's word. Sinful man had no regard for God's word. So this is what they did. They, they crossed the line over and over and over again. Listen, look here. What else is left other than, other than judgment? What, what else is God expected to do? Listen, they just didn't transgress it. They just didn't step over the line one far too many times. But listen, let's keep reading verse number five. It says, they changed the ordinance. Listen, an ordinance. What's an ordinance? An ordinance is somewhat like a mandate or a decree. Okay, listen. Calvary Baptist Church has ordinances. Okay, we have ordinances. One ordinance is baptism. A decree. It's something that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, that means if baptism is an ordinance, then that means we need to start seeing people saved. That means we obey the Great Commission. That means we give out gospel tracts. That means we tell people about Jesus. That means we invite people to church. And when we baptize them, then praise God, we're, we're, we are fulfilling that decree. We're fulfilling that ordinance of baptism. Come on. Here's what we're doing. Another ordinance is the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The Lord said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And he was talking to the church. He was talking to his disciples, the first church there. And, and so, as churches start churches, no, listen, 2,000 years later, here we are, Calvary Baptist Church, and we should still do the Lord's Supper. It's a decree. It's something that we're supposed to do. Now, now what they were, uh, verse number 5 says, they changed the ordinance. What sinful man was doing was rather than allowing God's word to change them, they changed God's word to suit them. They were making changes to God's word to make it more acceptable to fit their lives. Listen, this, again, this seems like the day and age which we're living in. You know, at one time, it was universally recognized that it was wrong to lie. At one time, it was universally recognized that it was wrong to cheat. One time it was universally recognized that it was wrong to uh, be sexually immoral. To be shacking up with somebody. For sodomy to be taking place. Homosexuality to be taking place. It was universally wrong here. But nowadays, the end justifies the means. 
Nowadays, is listen, it's okay to do wrong as long as it results in you being happy. It's okay to do wrong as long as it produces good results and it's inclusive for everybody. Listen, nowhere in the Bible does it say that, my friend. Verse 5 says, broken the everlasting covenant. Isaiah refers to God's word as an everlasting covenant that he has given to man. And, and listen, church, it is everlasting. God's word is everlasting. Well, how do you know it's everlasting? Because Jesus said this, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Listen, what man has done is that they have broken the covenant in the sense that they transgressed against the word and that they changed the word rather than allowing the word change them yeah. okay now here's a deep thought here you ready for this i know i know you you went to work and you're busy and you're tired but here's a really deep thought if man just obeyed the word they wouldn't be in the tribulation if man just obeyed the word and believed the word and did what the word said they wouldn't be in the tribulation period because the word shows us on how to escape the tribulation period. How's the word? How do we escape the tribulation period? The, 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 through the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the way man escapes the tribulation period is by faith in the Lord Jesus. Because listen, what we're waiting for right now is for the Lord Jesus to call us home. Yeah. That's what we're waiting for. And, and listen, ladies and gentlemen, if, if man would just take God at his word here uh, tonight and... and, and, and uh, and not wait for the rapture, then, then listen, then we would all be with him today. So, okay. <clears throat> so what's this have to do with us then? Give me a minute and I'll explain. I'm trying to go rapid. I'm trying to go fast here. Pastor, if this, if this has to do with those who are going to go through the tribulation. What's that have to do with me? I've accepted Christ. I'm going to be in heaven. What's that have to do with me? I'm glad you asked. You know, I, I believe that there's a principle here that God wants us to know. Okay? And the principle is this. That just because you're saved, that doesn't mean... That sin cannot defile your life. Sin can defile your life. And if we have no regard for God's word, just like sin can defile the earth, sin can defile your entire life. Yeah. But here's the thing. Sin doesn't have to defile your life. Sin doesn't have to contaminate your entire life. Well, how do we prevent sin from contaminating my entire life? How do I prevent sin from contaminating my family's life? Listen, how can I prevent sin from contaminating my kid's life, my children's life, my grandchildren's life? Then, then listen, this is what we do. Here's the secret. Have regard for the word of God. Have regard for the truth of the scriptures. Have regard for, for your Bible. Have regard for it. Because listen, just because we're saved doesn't mean that we are exempt from transgressing against God's word. Listen, just because we're saved doesn't mean that we're exempt from crossing the boundaries. Doesn't mean that we're exempt from stepping out of the boundaries from God's word. Now listen, once again, every time we sin, we cross boundaries that God has set before us. Now, again, God didn't give us his word to enslave us. God didn't give us this word to put some limitations on us, to box us in and say, you're not allowed to have fun over here, and you're not allowed to have fun over here. No, no, no. When, he, when God gave us these boundaries, it's not to keep us in bondage. These boundaries really set us free. These, the, these boundaries set us free from the bondage of sin. It is absolutely astounding how people can believe that they think that if I can live apart from this, well, then now I'm free. 
If I live apart from that, I can do whatever it is that I want. And they have it confused in their mind thinking, I have liberty. I have freedom. I can do what I want to do. I can date who I want to date. I can party as long as I want to party. I can stay out as long as I want to stay out. I can shack up with this guy. I can shack up with this girl. And I can do whatever it is that I want because I'm free. No, you're not free. You're in bondage to your sin. You're in bondage. And here's the thing. People who try to live apart from that over here thinking they're free. Listen, they never, ever find fulfillment. They never, never find satisfaction. They never, ever find like they're always left empty. Tom Brady, after he won, I think it was his third Super Bowl. Now, I know not everybody watches football, but who here knows who Tom Brady is? <laughs> Tom Brady. Okay. My own daughter raised her hand. She knows who Tom Brady is. <laughs> In case you don't know who Tom Brady is, he's the most accomplished quarterback ever. Ever. He has won more Super Bowls. He alone, he the man, not the team he's on, he, the man, has won more Super Bowls than any team. He has accomplished more than any player has ever accomplished. They call him the greatest of all time football player, and it's really hard to argue that. After he won his third Super Bowl, he said something along these lines. Now, don't quote me on this for sure, but, I, but my, my idea is accurate here. He said something along these lines. There has to be more to life than this. This is Tom Brady. There has to be more to life than this. The man's a millionaire. The, the man has everything any man could ever want. Millions of dollars. Fame. Luxury. Can I put it this way? Freedom. Freedom. And you know what he's saying? This is empty. There's nothing here. There's got to be more. Listen, there, there, has, there has to be more than this Lombardi trophy. There has to be more than that. You're right, there is. There is a whole lot more. But the only way that you're going to find a whole lot more is if you stay within the boundaries of this book. Because when you stay within the boundaries of God's word, listen, then there's fulfillment. Then there's satisfaction. Then there's meaning behind life. Because listen, your life is not about yourself anymore. Your life is about glorifying God who is eternal. And, and, and listen, listen, church family. There's a real danger when we have no regard for God's word. And we're living outside the confines. We're living outside the boundaries of his word. Well, what's the danger? The danger is this. That we begin to justify our sin. We begin to justify it. And we have no regard, listen, rather than allowing God's word to change us, if we're living out here, rather than allowing God's word to change us, this is what we'll say, we want that to change to suit us. Well, well listen, I'm not saying that you're going to go out and start a new revised version of the Bible. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But let me give you an example. Do you know how many churches are promoting the LGBT community? A lot. A lot. Okay, now, now listen. Now hear me out here. Jesus loves them. He died for them. He wants them to be saved. We should want them to be saved. If a homosexual walks into here, we should be thankful that they're here. Come on. We should be thankful that they're here. If a homosexual comes in here and hears the gospel and they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, we rejoice with them. Absolutely. And we need to do our best to try to encourage them, to help bring them along, to help, to, to help live, to have a more sanctified life, to, to save them from that life, uh, to, to help bring them out of that lifestyle. Absolutely we should. But, but here's the thing. The problem with churches promoting it this is what they're conveying. They're conveying and saying this. God is okay with it. 
No, he's not. No, he is not. And the reason why they're saying God is okay with it is because they have no regard for what he really says. They have no regard. Now listen, we can kind of do the same thing if we're not careful. No, we can begin to think something like this. Does God really care that much about my private sin? Does he really care that much about it? Does, I mean, I can still be in good standing with God. I know I'm living outside the boundaries, but I can still be in good standing with him. Can I? Uh, I mean, come, come on now. You know what we're doing? With our lives, we're making God's word say something it doesn't say. We're changing it to try to make it fit us. Am I making sense here? Okay. I know God's word says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, but, but surely he can't care that much about church attendance, can he? Well, he cared enough for the church to die for it. There's your answer. I know the Lord says I should be sanctified, set apart, but I don't necessarily see what's wrong with laughing at the same dirty chokes that my coworkers laugh at or, or watching the same type of entertainment that has pornographic material in it or, or rated R movies that use the Lord's name vain over and over and over and over again. It can go through one ear and out the other and you drop F-bombs left and right, but it just really doesn't bother me at all. I, I don't really necessarily see what the big deal is. I mean, I think I could still watch this type of movies and still be in a good relationship with God, can I? I, I, I think I can, uh, I, I, or I can listen to the same type of music that the world listens to, or dress like the world dresses, or, or, or be a part of the, the worldly entertainment. I can still do that, can I? And all we're doing is this. We're trying to make change this to fit our lifestyle outside the boundaries. Listen, listen, it don't work that way. We don't change God to fit us. We don't do that. By his grace, we submit ourselves and we allow him to change us to fit his boundaries. Hey, listen, when we start sounding like that, we're justifying our sin. But here's the thing. When we justify our sin, it only reveals one thing. Now look here. Wake up, please. It only reveals one thing. We don't have regard for the word. We don't have regard for it. So this is what I encourage us to do tonight. Let's have regard for the word. Well, how do we have regard? Well, we can have regard for God's word by, here's, here's a shocker, spending time in it. There's a start. We can have regard for God's word by reading it. It's really got to start there. We can have regard for God's word by not just reading it. How about studying it? Studying it. L- listen, church, I, 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 know it's, I know it's hard sometimes to just sit down and just crack open the Bible and just read the Bible. I understand it's just hard sometimes. But, but listen, when, when, you, when you sit down and you just get a good Bible dictionary or you open up a concordance and you just find a passage and you, and you try to get the, 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 uh, the, the, the original idea of what the biblical author was inspired to write and, and you, you begin to pick apart verses and you just study God's word. Hey, hey listen, this is what I'll do. It like brings God's word in HD what it does i think i used the analogy before it's like i mean when i was a kid we had vhs we know what vhs is right of course we had vhs and then there was dvd and then there's blu-ray and now there's 4k is there anything after 4k i don't know i can't afford it if it is so i don't know i don't know I mean, 4K, just, I don't know. It's like more clear. But if you do a comparison between like 4K and VHS, you're going to notice there's a big difference there. Hey, when you read your Bible, you still get the message. You still get it. But when you study the Bible, 
4K, surround sound. Am I making sense? Yeah, you all watch too much TV, that's why. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, if you're going to have regard for God's word, read it. But don't just read it, study it. And, and listen, don't just study it. Listen, memorize it. Memorize God's word. Listen, don't, don't, don't just let God's word just be something that you just kind of study off on the side and just like, oh, well, that's good to know information. No, no, when you read God's word and you study God's word, you memorize God's word. Well, why is it so important to memorize God's word? Listen, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against thee. You know what's going to keep you? Look here. You know what's going to keep you from getting out of the boundaries? You know what's going to keep you from keeping you safe within the boundaries of God's word? You regard his word. You read it. You study it. You memorize it. You get in it and you make sure it gets in you. And when it gets in you, listen, then you're safe. You're safe. You're in his boundaries. There's no safer place to be, church. There's no safer place to be. Listen, there's no safer place to be in your marriage than in his boundaries. There's no safer place to be in your, for your family than in his boundaries. There's Calvary Baptist Church, listen, as Calvary Baptist Church, there's no safer place for us to be as a church than to be in his boundaries. Yeah. So this, but this is what we have to do. We have to have regard for the word. Do you have regard for the word? Do you have regard for his word tonight? I mean, uh, really. Or, or do we justify, I can still live this life and still be okay with God? No, friend, you can't. You can't. Now, he still loves you here. Praise God. He still loves you. But I'll just tell you, it's not the safe place to be. It's not. Church, let's have regard for the word. Let's have regard for the word in your personal life and in our church life. Because listen, this is safe. Listen, this is safe. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank